By now, everyone knows all about Eric Ten Hag and how he likes to play football. They've read all the pieces, they've watched the videos, and so they have a really good idea of how Manchester United are going to play next season, right? Actually, I'm going to argue it's a little bit more complicated than that. Eric Ten Hag burst onto the scene in 1819 with an Ajax team that won the Dutch League, they won the Dutch Cup, and they went really deep in the Champions League going toe-to-toe -to -toe against teams like Bayern Munich, Real Madrid, uh, Spurs, and also Juventus. So I've got the Ajax team on the board in front of me here from that season. As you can see, they play a 4-2-3-1. There's lots of interesting things about this, this team. Lots of positional movements, lots of flexibility, lots of interchanges of players. And so let's just have a look at how this team like to function. So let's start off at the forward line, because the first thing to notice is Dusan Tadic. Dusan Tadic, you may remember from his time at Southampton. Didn't play as a striker at Southampton, but plays as a false nine in this 18-19 team for Eric Ten Hag. As a false nine, he likes to drop. We know that that's what false nines do. And when he makes this movement in here, you're going to see Donny van der Beek making this parallel movement the other way. So you're seeing an interchange already there. Donny van der Beek, actually a lot of his profile looks much like a striker. Um, he gets into the box, he receives the ball in the box a lot as well. So already interchanges here. And when you're playing with a false nine, obviously you leave a lot of space here at the edge of the box free. And, and that allows these two wide players actually to come quite narrow. So you've got Ziyech and Neres coming in here. And obviously when you do that kind of thing, you're leaving a huge amount of space in these areas for these fullbacks to, to attack. So we're already seeing plenty of, of movement between these players switching positions, finding other places to move to. Midfield, we've got a double pivot here of two very different players. Frankie de Jong, everyone knows all about. Brilliant ball carrier, he's going to get down the left-hand side here, uh, carry the ball and lay it off. But he's also really good in build-up moments, so he can drop into the fullback area here and allow Taliafico to get forward or you may see him dropping in between the centre-backs as well, just to help out with the build-up process. And that leaves Scherner, who is going to push forward on the right-hand side, but he's also going to be uh, thinking about his defensive positioning when De Jong is dropping into one of these two spaces. The two centre-backs, Daly Blint and Matthias De Ligt, very famous, uh, and then Masraoui, the other, the, the right-back here, just getting down the line. So that is how Ajax looked in 2018-19. And within three years, the team has changed completely. Now, part of the sign of a successful team is that your players become so good that they all move on. And as we can see from the sides here, there are eight players who are switched out of that original Ajax 18-19 team. So let's just take a look at the 21-22 season Ajax. So let's start again at the front. First thing to notice, most important thing, Sebastian Allaire is brought in as a lone striker. Now, he's not going to play as a false nine, he's going to play very much as a, a box striker here, which is going to change the tenor of things up front. Now, you don't want to get rid of Dusan Tadic because he's such a great creative player, and so David Neres goes off, and uh, we don't see much of him through the course of the season. Hakim Ziyech is sold to Chelsea, and uh, another player is brought in, a very exciting player in Anthony. He's been rumoured links with Manchester United. Now, Anthony is very different from Ziyech. Ziyech likes to get into the central spaces. Anthony is much more of a touchline hugging winger. And obviously when you've got a, a striker in the, in the middle, there is less space to get into in, in the middle there. So this opens up space in a different area for Masraoui. So rather than Masraoui going down the line, we're gonna see him inverting instead and getting onto into this very dangerous line towards the goal. Tadic is gonna hang around here and do creative Tadic things. Uh, he'll often come inside, invert as well, and, and be creative in these sorts of areas. Donny van der Beek, we know, has a failed experiment at Manchester United, and he is replaced by Stefan Berghuis, who, rather than actually playing as a striker in the way that we saw van der Beek play, because there's no false nine, we're going to see him sitting more as an attacking midfielder here. Let's have a look at the, the two pivot players then. Frankie de Jong goes, as we know, to Barcelona, and he's replaced by Gravenberch who is actually very similar in a lot of respects, but also different too. He's going to be a player who likes to get on that forward run, but actually where he's slightly different to De Jong is that right at the end of his forward runs, he likes to come across into the edge of the D, he got a few goals from this sort of area. So a little bit more of an attacking presence than Frankie De Jong, but still a ball carrier all the same. And Gravenberch is not going to be a player that we see dropping in between the lines here. Uh, he's going to be much more uh, solid in the middle. Schoener goes to another Eredivisie club and he's replaced by Edson Alvarez. Now Edson Alvarez is interesting because he's actually a centre-back who's brought to play in the back line uh, and he gets pushed forward into more of a defensive pivot player. It's actually him who does these interesting movements 
uh, dropping in between the back line or into the fullback area to allow the player on this side, Masrawi, to get further forward as well. But he's a very, very defensive player. Delayed off to Juventus, as we know, and Daly Blint actually is moved out onto the left back side, and Talia Fico doesn't get much of a, a look in during the season. But the two centre backs are replaced by these two new players, so Lissandro Martinez and Urien Timber, another player who's been rumoured to have links with Manchester United as well. And Anna has a long ban, and so we see Passover for most of the season dropping in here. So this team is completely different from what we saw before. And as you can see from the way that these build-up patterns are happening, very, very different. We've got fullbacks coming inside. Daly Blint is not the sort of player who's going to get overlaps and do long busting runs. He's going to sit in here as well. He's got great passing range. Uh, so he can sit in this sort of in inverted position and help build things up as well. So very, very different types of teams. And we can show these differences using the data because what I've got in front of me here uh, from our friends at Analytics FC are two pizza charts which show the play style differences between the 2018-19 season and the 2021-22 season here for Ajax. Now the first thing to notice is that there are stylistic similarities between these two seasons. On the one hand, you've got high retention, so Ajax are possessing the ball well. Crossing and counter-pressing, these are all repeated across both seasons. There's also deep circulation that we need to have a look at here. So you can see that as time goes by, Ajax get better and better at possessing the ball. So deep circulation is just passing the ball around the back. So what we see is a team that's moving from slightly less controlled to more control in those three years. And this is backed up by the fact that transitions here, you can see is very high. So in early Ten Hag's Ajax, you're getting players going forward at much more speed, much more directly, uh, and that drops off in the, in the later iteration of Ajax here. Wing play, as we've talked already, with Allaire being the focal point of that team, there was more space in the wide areas, and so no surprise then that in 21-22 we see an optic in terms of the wing play. We've got some more data here too, which is the pizza charts for the three midfielders from both seasons. So on the top here, 2018-19, the midfield three, and the midfield three from 21-22 here. Now, lots of writing on this page, but don't worry too much about the writing. Look at the colors on the charts. We've got possession stuff in green, we've got goal creation in blue, and we've got defending in red. So the thing I want you to notice here is that when we compare these players against their counterparts, actually there's a lot of changes between who is doing what in the midfield three. So if we start off with Frankie de Jong, we've already talked about how he's a great ball carrier. Um, you can see he's got really good carry and dribble volume here, and that's repeated by Ryan Gravenberch here. So both of these players are expected to carry the ball into more advanced areas. The difference is though that we see that Frankie de Jong is generating a lot more expected goals from ball progression here than Ryan Gravenberch. And actually a lot of the work for goal creation is coming from Stefan Berghaus, who we saw as a central midfielder in the newer system, unlike Donny van der Beek, who's playing as more of a second striker. And then if we look at the defensive portions here, the red portions, the majority of the work is being done across all three players in the 18-19 season. But when we look at the 21-22 season, we can see that Edson Alvarez, that centre-back who's been converted to a pivot player, he's doing a lot of the defensive work here and uh, his teammates don't have as much to do. So the thing to notice here is that all of these midfielders are doing the same thing in both teams, but they're sharing the responsibilities differently. Now you may say to me, well, this is still the same system, the stylistic similarities, both teams are playing in a 4-2-3-1. So we do know a certain amount about Eric Ten Hag, right? Actually, let's go back in time, have a look at Eric Ten Hag's CV and see how he played earlier in his career as a manager. So I've got Eric Ten Hag's CV in front of me here. As you can see, he ends his playing career around 2002 with FC Twente and then goes immediately into the youth management system there. He becomes the assistant manager under Fred Rutten, then follows him to PSV. 2012 is a big year for Eric Ten Hag because it's the first full managerial job that he gets. He goes to Go Ahead Eagles in the second division of Dutch football, does really well with them, actually gets them promoted through the playoffs. And he makes a really interesting decision at this point because rather than staying with Go Ahead Eagles in the league and moving up a division, he moves to Bayern Munich Zwei, the second team of Bayern Munich in the Regionalliga in Germany, so the fourth tier of, of German football. Now the thing about 2013 Bayern Munich is that the senior manager at that time is Pep Guardiola, so this is clearly a really important time for Eric Ten Hag in terms of his development tactically. And from here he goes back to the Netherlands, back to the Eredivisie to FC Utrecht, 
with all of these tactical ideas going on in his head. Now we need to talk a little bit about the context at this point because in 2015, it's a year before the Dutch national team failed to make the Euros and then in 2018 they then failed to make the World Cup as well. So this is a very stultifying time in, in Dutch football and the arguments that are often given is that tactically Dutch football had hit a bit of a wall. So let's take a look at some of these tactical ideas and see what's going on. Now in 2015 in the league Every team that Eric Ten Hag plays against plays in a very specific way. They play in a 4-2-3-1 and then out of possession, the wingers drop in, the 10 pushes up and they defend in a 4-4-2 block. Now Eric Ten Hag does some interesting things. He starts off with a 3-5-2, which no one does, decides it doesn't work and then switches to this 4-4-2 with a diamond. And actually what he's doing is almost the exact opposite of what everyone else is doing because in possession he's playing in a 4-4-2, but out of possession what you see is the two strikers push wide, the 10 pushes up, and then you're defending in a 4-3-3, which is quite similar to what we see from Liverpool at the moment. Now in terms of what we see in possession, you're gonna see two strikers pushing forward, and they're happy to pass the ball around the back a little bit, but if they're put under any pressure, they're just gonna play the ball long to one of these two strikers, try and hold it up. They're not scared of going long whatsoever. Now we can see this in the data. So let's just have a look at this. We've got two pizza charts here, again, from our friends at Analytics FC, and they are showing the play style of Eric Ten Hag's Utrecht. And we divided this in two. So on the one hand, we've got teams at the top of the table. This is how Utrecht played against them. And then teams at the bottom of the table. And this is how Utrecht played against them. Now, if we start off with these bottom of the table teams, we can see the beginnings, the emergence of Eric Ten Hag's stylistic ideas here. So high retention, crossing, counterpress, these were all things that we saw in early Ajax. Transitions are a little bit higher here, which is again something we saw in early Ajax, but then they reduced down. But everything else starting to look at very similar to what we see in those early days. Now that makes a certain amount of sense because against teams at the bottom of the table, you'd expect Utrecht to be able to control the ball, possess the ball and be able to do a little bit more with it. Now when we look at the teams at the top of the table, we can start seeing that Utrecht are playing in a very different way. The high retention has dropped, the crossing has dropped, the counter pressing has dropped. But we're starting to see other things emerge as well. So low block pushes up, long balls are starting to happen much more. And so this suggests that Eric Ten Hag is actually a much more flexible manager. When he's faced with teams that are better than his team, he's going to do slightly different things. And this raises the question of what kind of manager are we going to see at Manchester United next season? Because it's not going to be the case that he's going to be managing a team like Ajax, who are expected to dominate every game. There are going to be some games where he's playing against teams that are better than him. So anyone who tells you that they know exactly what Eric Ten Hag is going to do next season is lying. There's actually going to be much more flexibility, a lot more going on, and it's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic is home to some of the world's best sports journalists, including David Ornstein, Daniel Taylor, Ollie Kay, Amy Lawrence and Rafa Honigstein. There are journalists dedicated to each Premier League team, so every fan gets the coverage they deserve, not just the big clubs. And you can try it for free now for 30 days. See the link in the description.